The opening of episode 7 features the same exact sequences as we saw in episode 2 and 5, where they are stitched together for a more comprehensive overview of the events of Shagan, Shina and Trost. Only this time, the horror and almost mystery-like aspect of it is replaced by utter hopelessness. As we hear the same somber piano we heard with Mika's story last episode underneath Armin's narration. <laughs> And with a simple musical switch, the entire outlook on the situation is changed substantially, as it's no longer a mystery or overwhelming odds to overcome. Rather, it is just a cold retelling of horrific events, almost as if defeat was inevitable. Considering the events of the past couple of episodes, I think this was a really smart and subtle change to encapsulate the thematic notes of everything we've recently seen. Especially when watching the series for the first time, I remember just how quickly even those early day beliefs about what the story would be about were completely flipped on their heads. And this subtle change captures all that very, very well. Though importantly, the end of Armin's narration is establishing that contrast to follow. He says that as a result of the scout's work, no civilians were devoured. But the same cannot be said for the soldiers. And we then cut to Mikas' final words from the previous episode, saying that if Eren is here, she can do anything. In hindsight, we all of course know that Eren's completely fine, but thematically, this is sort of inverting much of what we've seen before. So far, whenever we talked about super happy scenes or scenes of triumph, most of them were setting up the inevitable downfall, right? Well here, we open the episode with it blatantly telling you that things are on an all-time low. And it's exactly this that would set up Eren's triumph and return as a titan in these next couple of episodes. It will continue to be an underlying aspect of these upcoming episodes, so just keep that in mind. As for the title of the episode, A Small Blade. In my mind, I think this refers to a few events in this episode. The first one is the easy one. The broken blade that Mikas has, which is also a callback to the small knife she had in the flashback. So, it's essentially a repeat of that situation. Mikasa collects herself and readies her small blades, just like she did when she was a kid. The second interpretation I would offer up is for Armin. Later in the episode, we see him transfer his remaining gas to Mikasa, saying that she would make a much bigger difference than he ever could, and finishing by saying that all he wants is a small blade to, you know, this is YouTube, so I'll have to scoot around that specific word, but I'll just say he wants a quicker way out than getting eaten by a titan. We'll get to this more later in the episode, but with Mikasa herself overcoming death, she tosses the blade away, both thematically implying that their fight is over as Eren's titan appears, as well as once again echoing Eren's statement of fighting until the end no matter what. Though yeah, we'll get to all those scenes much more in depth a tad later. The first thing we see in this episode is a clash between Captain Warman and some of the younger soldiers. And yes, I have literally no clue how you pronounce his last name, so I'll just keep on winging it. Here, we basically see a brief insight into the human psyche and how certain people deal with such excess stress, which would of course be a major throughline for this entire episode. The thing with the captain is that even as he was delivering his initial speech in episode 5, his expression was already very tense and almost as if he was perpetually terrified. And all of that is on full showcase here. He essentially hides behind the military code to try to ensure his own safety, even turning on and threatening his own subordinates to do so. Though again, it's just an example of the various ways fear manifests. Which leads us on to another scene where we see the soldiers cooped up in the HQ building. Here too, we see the paralyzing fear they are in. Only here, we see one of them, again, I can't say the specific word, but take the quick way showcasing another way this extreme fear can manifest. It is a very, very small scene, but I think in this episode's overall narrative, which is very much about showcasing the darkest hours of this mission, it very neatly establishes that hopeless tone, and all the ways the young and even experienced soldiers try to cope with said hopelessness. And another thing to note here are the titan roars which, to me, have always stuck out as much more monster-like than what they usually actually sound. In this sequence, I feel like the guttural sounds are much more in the forefront to accentuate those almost feral-like tones in their screams. 
which, aside from the Titan Shifter's screams, we barely ever see. Essentially, I feel like the idea here was to emphasize the horror-like aspect of the soldiers feeling trapped, and a subtle change in how the Titans sound just to capture that typical horror vibe of a monster roar down a long, dark hallway. Following this, we cut to Jean's squad, who are basically sitting ducks, as they are all either completely out of gas or running very, very low. Here too, we see another perspective of everything going on, as Jean says he can sympathize with their fear, but that he still sees the resupply soldiers who abandoned their mission and hid in the HQ as responsible for what is happening right now. Again, just a small scene to hammer home the idea that everyone is coping differently. Some blame others, some blame themselves, some try to find a way out, etc, etc. And speaking of which, Connie then speaks up, saying that they must take on the Titans since, at this point, there is literally nothing else they can do. This is one of those classic war story tropes that are always interesting to explore. Because yes, at the end of the day, what is better? Sitting back and just waiting to die? or going out fighting even if there is even the slightest chance of survival? The easy and logical answer is of course the latter. Even if it is a 1% chance, it is still a chance. But fact of the matter is, when you're terrified out of your mind, it is much, much easier to pick the former. And Jean identifies just that. The soldiers are paralyzed with fear and such a mission in their state of mind is simply pointless. Remembering that Jean's plan was always to end up in the military police, and that if this attack had happened literally the following day he would have been fine, it's no wonder that his spirit too is somewhat crushed. And that is even further reinforced as we cut to Sasha joyfully trying to keep spirits high. But as she sees Armin, even her enthusiasm is gone in a split second. Because it's pretty clear that even her closest friends who'd usually support her calls to action are crushed. And I think with scenes like these, all the wacky stuff we've talked about with Sasha's character finally sees a payoff. As in this case, the entire purpose of her trying to keep spirits high is just that. To show that they are in the deepest depths of despair. No amount of wackiness or cheering will change that. Though we then get a particularly interesting scene that really stands out in retrospect. As we see Annie ask, Reiner, what now? On initial viewing, as we heard in episodes before, Reiner is always exhibited naturally strong leadership, so you just take it as them asking for guidance, right? Well, in hindsight, what if Annie's question here is actually, so, are we going to breach the wall now? Remember that just trust was breached, the wall itself is still perfectly fine. Reiner of course just responds by saying to wait and that they need everyone's help. But obviously, they can't just speak openly, so if he was speaking in code or trying to keep everything low-key, it's just the wait part that would be relevant for Annie. So, could this all just be speaking in code and talking about breaching the wall? I don't think it's that big of a stretch to be honest. Though with that said, I may totally be reading into this way too much and they are generally wondering what they'll do about the Titans. But hey, this is called overanalyzing Attack on Titan for a reason, okay? And speaking of cheeky scenes, I love how Marco just so happens to be right by the Marley squad's side for much of these early episodes. He would of course later overhear them talking about their Titans, which prompted the Marley squad to quickly silence him. So him being buddy-buddy with them would also be his demise, so yeah. In retrospect, it's just a bit funny seeing him here all the time. But hey, it is also realistic, right? Even looking back, the whole overhearing them deal isn't just a cheap way to build drama. Because yes, Marco has always stuck by their side even as early as this. So is it really that surprising that he did overhear them at some point in time? We then cut to Mikasa who, not surprisingly, immediately asks for Eren. As Armin hears her voice, however, we immediately cut to his inner monologue because he is clearly extremely ashamed of everything that happened. As he himself says, he doesn't think he was worthy of Eren's sacrifice, and in his mind, he'll have to live with that guilt for the rest of his life. And with Mikasa, that is only exacerbated as he obviously knows full well just how much Eren means to her. And the scenes we get here are so emotionally charged, it's just brilliant. 
At first, Armin is too emotionally shaken to even respond to her, so he simply lifts his head and shows his terrified face. And obviously, Mikasa knows right away. Even before he says a single word, Mikasa knows. But his shame is so, so strong that he still feels like she deserves an answer. But it's too much. So he speaks to her on a professional level. He simply recounts all the fallen soldiers as if it was a report, not a conversation with a friend. Similar to the captain we talked about a few minutes ago, it's his way of shielding himself from the tragedies he has witnessed. He plays his soldier persona because Aaron Jaeger is just a soldier, not his lifelong friend, Aaron. And it's only after all of that that Armin finally speaks for himself, simply saying, I am sorry, Mikasa. Aaron died in my stead, I couldn't do anything. This is another one of those scenes that, even when taken on the face of it, is just beautifully tragic. All foreshadowing and meta-narrative analysis aside, the way emotion is written here is simply excellent. The sheer despair of Armin and all the other soldiers for that matter is just captured so so well here. And what drives all of that hope for me is when Mikasa responds to Armin. Obviously we've seen that basically always she is cold and composed. But here, her eyes are just dead. It's not composure in this scene, it's just lack of any emotion at all. And obviously, once she says that this isn't the time to get sentimental, Armin's surprise isn't just because she didn't even linger on the loss of Eren, but rather it's because he immediately knows something about Mikasa is off. We'd get to this exact point in just a moment, so hold that thought for a second. We then see Mikasa get up and address all of their worries. They'll take out the Titans at the HQ, refuel, and they'll be fine. And even before anyone can doubt her, she says she can do it. She's stronger than all of them. And note how while she's saying this, her stare is just dead. At this point, she has nothing to lose. She just pulls the, I'll be rude and mean just to spite you and force you to move card. It's one last attempt to essentially guilt them into getting back up, but ultimately, it doesn't matter if she's the only one fighting anymore. If she dies, she dies. She even outright quotes Aaron saying, if I don't fight, I can't win. And to her, it's really as simple as that. Since Aaron is dead, she has no one else to protect, so all she can do is go out fighting. And of course, because Jean has the biggest crush on Mikasa ever, he can just sit back and listen to that. So he too calls everyone out for being a coward and zips off. And with that, purely out of spite, everybody gets back up. Similar to what I already mentioned before, here too I think there's an interesting discussion to be had around what actually motivates people the most. Personally, and I don't know whether this is a good or bad thing, but I do very much fall in the camp of often trying harder than I would purely out of spite for someone or something. I thought, or someone else thought that I couldn't do it, so I'll do it just to show them I can. It's a fairly childish way of looking at things, but hey, it often works. And in this case, I think that ultimately being more effective than any inspirational speech was an interesting angle, as just pushing through fear with anger is likely far easier than actually overcoming said fear. Obviously, all of them are still afraid anyone would be, but they still get up to fight. Alright, armchair psychology out of the way, there are a few more meta things I want to mention here. First off, this shot just pointing up the skies as we see the soldiers zip past is awesome. And secondly, this is of course another case of that upbeat classic triumphant music kicking in. Though as per usual, that would of course be very short lived. And all of that begins as we cut to Mikasa who's once again going all out against the titans. Only for that to be interjected by Armin, who realizes that she is actively burning up her remaining gas, and then saying she isn't calm like usual. For characters like Mikasa who always seem emotionally distant, it's easy to overlook what they're actually thinking, and I think this is the perfect example of that. As soon as we saw her dead stare, it was clear that she is not okay but it's difficult to pin down exactly what she's feeling. Though as soon as Armin realizes this, we see her run out of gas and fall right down to the streets below. And as we cut to her finally being forced to slow down, we hear her inner monologue begin to deconstruct what she's actually feeling, saying that once again she has lost her family, 
and asking why did she have to experience all of that again? And as we linger on her just staring at the ground, a titan begins stomping in the distance. And a small note here, the fact that the titan stomps still ring out as we fade into the mid cards is some excellent direction. And as I've said many many times before, combined with the sudden cut to silence just hammers home the sheer magnitude of its footsteps alone. And luckily, I'm not the only one who thinks the whole echoing, lumbering footsteps are an excellent part of the Attack on Titan vibe, as we later get an entire track called The Footsteps of Doom. But that is a separate tangent. As for the mid-cards, these are fairly straightforward and basically just give us a little bit of extra lore as to how the ODM gear works. Interesting, yes, but not much deeper than that. I think the only notable thing here is just the fact that the whole managing and improving the gear business is done in secrecy. Which would of course be an important plot point later with Annie and how she was ultimately caught as an imposter. Though that is pretty far into the future so let's not get into that now. Returning to the episode, just as soon as that upbeat poppy music began, we return to silence and titans stomping in the distance. And better yet, we see the rest of the soldiers also run out of gas and yet again, they are gobbled up one after another. And just like we saw with Armin, we see Jean just stand there and watch as his allies are torn apart. And once again, we're back to the orchestral music as we cut to Mikasa, who simply says, This world is cruel, but astonishingly beautiful. And it's as she says this that Birds in a Cage begins playing. I think the symbolism here shouldn't need any further elaboration. Next to her losing her parents as a kid, this is obviously her darkest hour. But if I can take a step back from the story for a moment, I am calling it right now. This world is cruel but astonishingly beautiful will be the last thing Mikasa says in the entire series. Manga readers, no spoilers please, but that line is too perfect not to use again. Especially in the context of what is happening with Eren. I rambled on about all of my theories a lot in the first episode, so I won't get into that now, but I think it fits in perfectly. That is, of course, unless Isayama pulls another 180 and Mikasa dies at Eren's hand and I'm like 300% wrong on everything I've said. But no, she'll say it, trust me, 105%. Alright, back to the story. The Titan stomps and the aforementioned birds in a cage continues as Mikasa simply says, It's been a nice life. Obviously, accepting her death here and now. Though of course, things are never as simple as that, because we then see her blood cells change and she gets right back up. If you remember what we talked about last time and the whole Ackerman bloodline, in my eyes, this sets in stone the fact that it has nothing to do with a host or Aaron or any other trigger like that. It's just raw survival instinct that literally keeps her from dying. It's so primal that she doesn't even fully control it herself. Just like with the power of the Titans, once the wielder is endangered or injured in the case of the Shifters, they transform and their latent power is activated. And accordingly, I think her following words can be interpreted in two different ways. The first is her just overcoming the loss of Eren and that's why she keeps going. Thematically, it's simple and it works. She realizes the message Aaron was trying to get across in the first place. She didn't and doesn't have to fight for him to live. She has to fight to live, period. And so, she does just that. Even if Aaron isn't here anymore. Giving up now would be wasting him saving her in the first place. So she gets back up and keeps going. Though the other is her really just being confused and not understanding what happened. She genuinely did give up, but it's the Ackerman bloodline that was too strong and forced her survival instincts to take control. Again, I draw parallels to the Titan Shifters because I genuinely believe that's what it is. But just like with them awakening their powers for the first time, it's involuntary. Eren never meant to transform into the Attack Titan after all. It's just his survival instincts that did that. And it's the same reason why the Shifters must have an injury to transform in the first place. There must be a reason for the power to kick in. But regardless of how you look at it, her powers are awakened and we get our first interpretation of the episode's title. Because even with a small and broken blade, she still fights off the Titan just like she did when she was a young kid way back when. 
And the parallels don't end there. Because just like when she was a kid standing against a grown-up, a grown-up Mikasa standing against a Titan has that same dichotomy of power and size. But again, aside from the analysis sides, the utter confusion in Mikasa's voice as she genuinely asks, why is she even fighting is another bit of excellent writing that, even in retrospect, hits particularly hard. But we're still not even at the best part, because as her inner monologue continues, we linger on this pomegranate. There are multiple cultural and religious perspectives on its significance, but in this case, I think the Greek and Persian mythologies capture it best. As here, I think it signifies fertility, beauty, rebirth, and eternal life. In both Aaron's and Mikasa's case, despite both coming face to face with death, both are still alive. Aaron is of course literally reborn, but Mikasa is simply too powerful to die. At the same time, it can also be viewed from a completely different angle. A symbol of power signifying blood and death. Which too nicely fits in with the whole Aaron dying and being reborn, and Mikasa being too strong to die. But point is, I think the rebirth aspect is the most important here. And as her inner monologue continues, we finally get to the best part. She continues denying that she has any will or reason to live, but as a second titan appears, we suddenly cut back to her flashback and Aaron telling her to fight. And just like that, she realizes that Aaron's one and only goal was to make Mikasa fight for herself and no one else. So she composes herself, apologizes to him, and promises to never give up again. And again, this is another one of those scenes that makes me believe that she will be the one to put down Aaron, because even in his death, he still drives her to fight for what she believes in. But all of that aside, that musical transition... <laughs> oh my god, that <laughs> guitar tinge is so good. I don't even know why, but it literally gives me chills. It is simply excellent. That brief moment of tranquility in the midst of this despair and while literally standing in front of a titan, perfection. And in a meta sense, the track fades from bird in a cage to counter, which of course also signifies what we see on screen. Mikasa breaks free of the cage and so is on the counter. But it's then that everything changes, because Mikasa is back in full force, saying that if she dies, she wouldn't be able to remember Eren anymore, which is a pretty beautiful way to look at it, to be honest. But she then readies her blade as we get this absolutely incredible perspective shot of her standing in front of this lumbering giant. And for the first time in this episode, the clouds part and a glimmer of sunshine shines through on that dreary day. But before she can do anything, a mysterious titan blasts the other one with a nasty right hook. So yes, here we finally get the payoff I've been going on about for the past few weeks. As literally the moment Aaron's titan returns, the clouds part for the first time since his apparent death. But the way the scene is executed is also just literal perfection. First off, we once again return to complete silence as all we hear is the overwhelming power of this titan throwing a punch. And to hammer home said impact, we see it three whole times, with the third literally being so strong that we are knocked right back into the manga for a second with red highlights literally emphasizing only the blood and the power rippling through Eren's muscles. And then that shot from Mikasa's perspective as we see her literally knocked into the air by its footstep alone just furthers that. And it's then that we switch to a completely different type of music. A heavy and pulsing beat. As just like Mikasa, the camera hovers around trying to get a grasp of what is going on. And then this perspective shot from below, to accentuate just how massive and straight up ripped this titan is, also of course furthers that sense of power. And with this shot, I think it clearly evokes almost a sculpture with clearly defined muscles and anatomy. Basically everything here is building him up as a figurative god, from the weather changing to his appearance and basically everything else. But then comes the best part, 
He lets out a roar that even makes Mikasa cover her ears. It's just an absolutely excellent way just to showcase how ridiculously powerful it is. To the point that even his voice is too strong to bear. And as that pulsing beat continues, we also get a few very interesting frames as Mikasa gathers her thoughts. In hindsight, it's fairly easy to pull everything together as if you go frame by frame, you literally see everything necessary to figure out that this is in fact Eren. We see those same exact shots of blood cells that we saw with Mikasa, the sun shining through the clouds and the pomegranate signifying his rebirth. On initial viewing, it of course wasn't nearly as clear, but all the clues are there. Though yes, returning to Eren's Titan itself, that entirely different type of music kicking in works extremely well. Because yes, everything has changed, and an entirely different genre of music embodies that. I have zero background in music, so I couldn't tell you exactly what kind of music this even is, but the constant switching from classic orchestral instruments to that electric, almost arcade-like distortion is incredible. It's almost as if its power is so unprecedented that it even bends its own theme. And yet again, as Eren throws a punch and literally takes off a titan's head with just that hit, that choir kicks in to even further that feeling that these events are truly on a grand scale. And just like last time, the whole going frame by frame and cycling through its muscles to drive home the idea that its punches are charged is some awesome direction. And the last thing we hear here is the fact that it is operating with intent. Its punches, its movement, it's not targeting humans. All of that implies that it is intelligent. As with many other things before, in hindsight, it is of course super easy to flag all those traits that just so happen to line up with the Colossal and Armored, but I think it's easy to forget that at this point in time, it was a massive stretch to say that humans could freely transform into Titans. And what complicates matters further is that unlike the Colossal and Armored, Eren's Titan went after other Titans. So as much as there are some major similarities, there are also a couple of things that make things far more complicated. Though moving into the final moments of the episode, we see the other interpretation of the title. As Armin gives his remaining gas canister to Mikasa, but says to leave a small blade behind, again implying that he wants a quick way out. So in essence, he is currently in the same situation Mikasa was just in. He has accepted his death and it's his way of making up for being paralyzed as he saw Eren's death. Though importantly, Mikasa doesn't allow him to fall to the depth she was in and tosses the blade away, telling him that she will not leave him. And just like that, we zoom out to see all of them looking at Eren's titan as the clouds have now parted and the sun shines through. And for the last time in this episode, Birds in a Cage begins to play once again, as Mikasa thinks back to what she just saw. A titan killing a titan, saying that that is unheard of, but that it was faintly uplifting. And finishing with the legendary phrase, because that scene seemed to be the embodiment of humanity's rage. Obviously, in the meta-narrative, Eren is quite literally the embodiment of humanity's rage, as in order to protect his own, he is actively wiping out the rest of the world, which, looking at historically, is exactly what humanity has done for a millennia. But even if you don't want to look at it in such a broad scope, the entire story leading up to Eren activating the Founder and starting the Rumbling has also been just that. Humanity banding behind Eren to protect him because he is the embodiment of humanity's rage and their only chance to win against the Titans. He's the one who plugged the wall, he's the one that led the charge against the Colossal in Armored, and he's the reason why countless soldiers went after the Beast, literally embodying primal rage. Though in the Season 1 narrative, a Titan turning on its own kind is the first proper glimmer of hope that there is a chance. As Mikasa said, this is unfounded. If Titans can fight on their side, the tide can and will change. That is the entire premise of the rest of the season after all. Understanding why and how Eren's power works, and how they can leverage it to better humanity. But with all that said, that is episode 7. And oh boy, do I love this one. 
Even knowing all the secrets and teeny tiny details behind all the mysteries, this one just features some absolutely excellent direction when Ehrenstein appears, beautiful animation and wonderful character-centric sequences. Which is why I also think the Season 1 narrative is so incredibly strong. Obviously there are plenty of mysteries, but there is still a story to be told that doesn't need to lean into said mysteries. If you wanted to, you could easily boil everything down and say that all those shots of the soldiers simply feeling hopeless were unnecessary, especially considering Eren was alive after all. But I feel like all of them are crucial in establishing the high highs and low lows we see throughout the bigger story. Moreover, even in retrospect, the entire thematic contrast that happens with Eren's death still feels extremely strong and not just a cheap fake-out death. And the realistic reception to his death just strengthens that. The entire tragedy is given room to breathe. But alright, without rambling on about it for 30 more minutes, that is where we'll leave it for now. Next time we'll of course follow up with our new Titan buddy, the Attack Titan, and also see the rebirth of Eren himself. So, I hope to see you there as we continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. Yet another chonker, but certainly an episode worth spending time on considering it's the first big appearance of Eren's Titan. But with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And I don't know what has happened, but let's also give a warm welcomes to the many, many new members of the team. Fight Club, who I was very tempted not to mention for the joke. Blue Buddy, Mafetan, Gumminup, Juan Padilla, and Debmit24. I am sorry if I butchered the names. But without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.